Hello and welcome back to Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical with me, your host and resident art historian, Joe McLaughlin. Welcome back. This week on the podcast, I'm going to be taking you through the art of pride. Now, what exactly is the art of pride? I hear you ask. And to set the scene a little more, back in June 2020, which June famously being Pride Month, I wrote an article celebrating artists and artworks which champion pride and LGBTQ plus rights. The article got quite a lot of traction and a lot of interest and I turned it into a series. So I thought it would be an interesting topic for the podcast and I'll kind of take you on a whistle stop tour of five works from within my blog post slash Instagram series, which I felt got the most traction. I'm going to be giving you a whistle stop tour of the history of the Pride flag. Discuss a London street artist who helped raise thousands of pounds for a local museum. And two of the first ever public monuments, which celebrate the rights of the LGBTQ plus community. This podcast is my way of celebrating the LGBTQ plus community and all the wonderful contributions that they've made, not only to the world in general, but to culture and society as a whole. So I really hope you enjoy it and let's get started as we celebrate together the art of pride. For me, I think the best place to start is really with one of the most iconic artworks that has ever been produced. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world, your beliefs, your sexual orientations, when you see this work of art, you know exactly what it stands for. And that, of course, is the original rainbow flag. Now, for some reason, it never really occurred to me that someone had to design this flag, that there was an artist that had put it together. But it's a really, really interesting story. And the original rainbow flag was made in 1978. Now, the flag is a little different than the one that you see today, but the original rainbow flag was designed by American artist and gay right activist Gilbert Baker. The design had eight colours, each with an individual meaning. So hot pink symbolised sexuality, red for life, orange healing, yellow sunlight, green nature, turquoise magic and the creative industries, so art, blue for harmony and purple for spirit. And the original version of the flag was first flown at the Gay Freedom Day Parade in San Francisco on June 25th, 1978. However, in order to make the flag easier to mass produce, the pink and the turquoise from the original designs were dropped, taking the number to six stripes, meaning the new configuration resembled that of an actual rainbow, which was the main inspiration for the design anyway and as well as the stripes being taken inspiration from the American flag. So there you are. So it was a rainbow was the original inspiration for the flag, and the flag takes its structure and aesthetic form, if you will, from the American flag. On designing the flag, the artist Gilbert Baker has said, we needed something to express our joy, our beauty, our power, and the rainbow did just that. I found this amazing article on the history of the original pride flag and in it Baker says it was necessary to have the rainbow flag because up until that point all we had was the pink triangle from the Nazis. It was a symbol that they would use to denote gay people. We needed something beautiful, something from us. The rainbow is so perfect because it really fits our diversity in terms of race, gender, age and all of those things. And I think that's a really interesting point to remember. So for people that don't know what this is, when people were sent to concentration camps under the Nazi rule in Europe, they had different symbols for different people. So obviously if you were Jewish, you had the Star of David, but if you were a a gay prisoner of war or a gay captive, you wore this pink triangle that identified you as a homosexual and you didn't fall into sort of Hitler's perfect regime. But what's even worse, as history has taught us, is once these camps were liberated and the Nazis fell, being gay was still a crime in most of Europe at this point. So essentially all these prisoners who were 
marked as gay, although liberated from concentration camps, a lot of them were then put into jails purely from being gay if being stuck in a concentration camp wasn't enough. So the pink triangle has a really dark history within the gay community and it's something that has actually been reclaimed and Keith Haring, my very first podcast episode on Joe's Art History podcast, talks about Keith Haring's pink triangle and his incredible work called Silence Equals Death. Now if you want to know a little bit more about the history of the pink triangle, Keith Haring and how the gay community have reclaimed this pink triangle, then go back to the very first episode of my art history podcast, which I did with my sister Nicole, aka Nico Paws, and it's called Keith Haring's Silence Equals Death. It's a really interesting conversation, and we discuss as well um, the Keith Haring retrospective, which happened at Tate Liverpool in 2019, so just shortly before the world completely imploded and COVID happened. Now, back to Baker. In 2004, Baker created a huge version of this flag, so it was a mile long, as a way of marking the 25th anniversaries of the Stonewall Riots. And if you don't know what the Stonewall Riots are, I'm just about to go on and explain, because one of the very, very first public artworks which celebrates LGBTQ plus rights in the community happened is in a memorial garden near Stonewall in New York. So he created a flag that was a mile long and I think for a little while it held the record of the biggest flag ever made and then in 2003 he made an even bigger version which was 1.2 miles long to mark the 25 years since he first unveiled the design. And each version contained the eight original colours. 2015 saw the flag enter the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art New York taking its rightful place among some of the greatest artworks ever created. Baker sadly died in 2017, but left behind an iconic emblem which will forever stand the test of time. And what's great about Baker's design is that it's continuously modified to be inclusive and represent the sort of growing spectrum of communities which fall under the LGBTQ plus communities. And it's really exciting that we live in a time where these symbols are so powerful that when you see a rainbow flag, you know exactly w- what it stands for, what it symbolises, but you might not know the history behind it. There is so many things I can say about this flag, but um, Baker actually has um, a foundation, which he set up before he sadly passed away, but it continues to work with the LGBTQ community and solidify one of the most monumental contributions to the movement in terms of giving them a symbol and something to rally behind. I think it's always lovely when you when you have a motive that you feel encompasses you as a person. I mean, for me as a Scot, I know how I feel every time I see a Scottish flag. It's very rare that I do, particularly living in England. But you have a sense of pride and community and belonging. And I think it's really important to remember that it's important and everyone should feel that they belong somewhere. And it's fabulous that this flag can do that for so many people. Now, I really briefly mentioned there the Stonewall riots, and this takes me on quite nicely to talk about one of, I think I think this was actually the first ever public artwork which commemorates LGBTQ plus rights and, the, and celebrates the community. And this is called the Gay Liberation Monument, and it's you can find it in New York, and it was unveiled in 1992. So the Gay Liberation Monument was good, was created by American artist George Segal. The work was unveiled at Christopher Park, New York in 1992 and is part of the Stonewall National Monument. The work was commissioned in 1979 by the Mildred Andrews Fund to commemorate the Stonewall riots which happened 10 years previously. These riots and marches saw hundreds of members of the LGBTQ plus community in New York rise up and reaction against police brutality, particularly on a raid in a place called the Stonewall Inn, which saw 13 people from the community forcefully arrested. The Stonewall Inn was a a gay bar and violent police raids were a common occurrence. Essentially, it was illegal to be openly gay and essentially the police used to monitor and surveillance places in New York, especially that they knew to be promoting and open to the gay community. 
And what they would do is they would go in and they would raid and pe- they would beat people up for no good reason and then arrest them purely for being gay. And the Stonewall riots, especially this day, were incredibly violent. The police came in, as we said, arrested 13 people and the community just had enough. And it turned into five days of rioting. The police actually sort of barricaded themselves into the Stonewall Inn and it set about this huge, huge chain reaction of the community and supporters of the LGBTQ community coming together and saying, no, this, is, this isn't this is right. We shouldn't be policed for being who we are. So these riots and marches, which happened in the wake of Stonewall throughout the summer of 1969, were so often attributed to the starting point of the gay rights movement in America. And this kind of led on to uh, the Gay Pride Parade, which happens every year in June. So it's a really interesting little sort of snippet of Pride history. Anyway, I'll go back to the monument. The Gay Liberation Monument is four bronze figures and each are in a really relaxed pose. So there's a white lacquer in which the figures are painted and is a signature feature of Segal's work. The simplicity of the work and its detail and relaxed nature of the poses symbolises the simplicity of what the LGBTQ plus community were asking for. Acceptance equal rights, as they, like everyone else, are human. The work is often decorated with clothing, particularly during Pride, which is really interesting. To me, dressing a work shows a love of a piece and that it's accepted by a community and that they've claimed it as their own. And it really reminds me, when I've been looking at images of how people have dressed this monument and these sculptures, because essentially it's two people that are standing and two people that are sitting and they each have their hands so one of the figures has their hands on someone's shoulder or someone's knee so it's really simplistic you would very non-offensive but I love the fact that they've claimed it as their own really and and dressed it for those who don't know I'm originally from Glasgow although I'm based in London now and we have a sculpture I think it's the Duke of Cumberland it's called and it's outside the Modern Museum of Art in Glasgow and it's maybe like Essentially, it's one of these like iconic things that you see whenever you see any sort of like doodles or images of Glasgow. You'll maybe see this gentleman who's sort of sitting on top of a horse, but he has a traffic cone on his head. And this is an ongoing joke with the people of Glasgow. And it's essentially it shows that the people of Glasgow have like claimed the sculpture and the statue as their own. And there was this whole back and forth thing when someone used to put the cone on top of the head Someone, but the police would then have to take it off. And then I think like 2017, Glasgow City Council just said, no, there just needs to be a cone on there at all times because we're wasting so much time. People like it. No one's offended by it. The cone stays. And it's kind of affectionately nicknamed as Conehead. So for me, that draws, why I'm, why I'm talking about this is my love of, of that sculpture in terms of it gives me a sense of pride and purpose and sense of belonging to a community because we've all sort of rallied around this work. When someone, in my opinion, dresses a work of art and tries to include them in something, it, it shows that they are symbolic and are very much part of a community and that they stand as anchors within a community, which is an interesting thing, really, when you think about public art and and what it says about the community that it keeps and the community that it's displayed within. So I would say, if you've never seen this, it's it's very unoffensive. It's very, if anything, very dull. Um, But it's just kind of trying to show you that it's equal rights and acceptance shouldn't be this huge, loud thing that you should bang the drum about. It should be a simple case of, yes, you are entitled to it. Anyway, I'll get back to the sculpture now. I'll stand off my soapbox. So... Segal was actually not the first artist to be approached for the commission, but he accepted the brief which stated the sculpture must be installed on public land and it had to show like a love and a care and the affection that was the hallmark of gay people and it had to also have an equal representation of men and women within it. It was completed in 1980 and was the first piece of public art dedicated to LGBTQ plus rights. However, although completed in 1980, it took 12 years, 12 years, to finally get the work installed on public land in New York due to public opposition, lack of installation funding and planned renovation of the park that it was due to be placed within. 
but it didn't just sort of sit in the artist studio. So it lived in the University of Wisconsin in Madison before it was installed in 1992. So it took 12 years for it to finally take its pride of place within the public realm. But it's a really interesting sculpture. And I've actually, I've never been to New York and it would definitely, definitely be on my list of things to visit. Now, while we're on the subject of public art, there's a really interesting public art project which I came across while I was researching for this project called The Legacy Project. And it's in Boys Town, Chicago. And it was founded in 2012, but the history kind of dates back a little more. And what the Legacy Project essentially is, it's, like, it's kind of a two-parter and it's kind of seen as the very first LGBTQ plus Hall of Fame, which is really, really interesting. So Chicago City commissioned an architecture firm called De Staffel and Partners to design a series of 20 pylons, so huge big gold pylons, and they were originally installed in 1998. So the pylons were installed in 1998. And by installing the pylons, it was the first time a city government had recognised an LGBTQ plus community, making Boys Town the first ever officially recognised gay village in the USA. So what makes these pylons so important and can be seen as a celebratory work of art in themselves? So each pylon was designed in the style of a steeped Art Deco skyscraper and possesses pride rings on each of their bases. Each pylon also holds a beacon of light at the top, which, when lit, symbolises hope, acting as a literal light in the darkness against prejudice and hate within the community. So it's really beautiful. Then in 2012, the Legacy Project selected the unique rainbow pylons as the location for the first outdoor museum, recognising the significant achievements, the significant world achievements, should I say, and contributions of LGBTQ plus people. And I'm going to read a statement from their website, which, in fairness, their website, when I wrote the article, was a little bit clunky. But in preparation for this podcast, I've gone back on and they've completely zhuzhed it up. It's actually fabulous. So I'm going to leave a link in the show notes below or just Google the Legacy Project Chicago because it's really, really interesting. So I'm quoting for the website here. I'm quoting from the website here. The Legacy Project illuminates and affirms the lives of LGBTQ plus people to honour their experience and accomplishments, to collect and preserve their contributions to world history and culture, to educate and inspire the public and young people, and to assure an inclusive and equitable future. Which is great in itself, but in 2019, the pylons have been enhanced with 40 illuminated bronze plaques dedicated to historically important figures within the community. So you have people like Josephine Baker, who was a famous activist, and people like Frida Carlo, Oscar Wilde, and Keith Haring as well. And the Legacy Walk was declared as a historic landmark in May 2019 as well. In early 2020, the Legacy Walk actually announced that it would be rotating its plaques in order to add more LGBTQ plus people from history and modern day who hold significant achievements. And going back to what I said about their website, it's so interactive and there are so many great facts about each of the plaques. So on each plaque on each pylon, there's at all times at least two, which celebrate somebody from within LGBTQ plus history who has been an activist and incredibly important and goes from very historic to modern day and they're adding new people all the time. What's even more interesting is that you can actually nominate people within your community to end up having a plaque and it's not just people it's also movements and symbols as well so they have the Stonewall Inn for example they have a plaque on there sort of commemorating the riots they have a plaque dedicated to the pink triangle that I mentioned earlier in the podcast and just the history of the symbolism and how the community have reclaimed it as something that used to oppress them and is now a symbol of their strength together and how that will they'll never again be marginalised. There's also a really great education tool on there and lesson plans. So teachers and parents from all over the world can use the Legacy Project as an education tool and to inform both themselves and their pupils or families about what the Legacy Project is about and celebrating members of the LGBTQ plus community. For me, this is a beautiful project and something that 
has continuously has legs to grow and educate and I just it's something that I completely applaud them for doing and it's just a, a great way of celebrating the globalness of the community but I think it's fabulous that this tool is completely free online it's free to go and experience if you're based in Chicago and or find yourself visiting but also when you go online it the profiles are just so in depth of the people so for example Frida Carlo gives you a fabulous blurb about her life her history there's a link for a lesson plan and then it also talks you through some of her commemorations her contributions in the different fields, so in art, music, literature, politics, education, what language she spoke, nations that she's affiliated with, or, and their sexual orientation. And Frida Carlo was bisexual, for those who don't know, and she's apparently had a very, very, a very, very famous love affair with Georgia O'Keeffe. So there's a surprising amount of people on there, and I would I will leave a link in the description box below, but please go and visit it. It's not it's in no way flashy, it's in no way the best public art or sculpture that I've ever seen but it's a really important one and it just shows that you don't really have to spend disgusting amounts of money to produce something that's meaningful meaningful for a community and is so educational and powerful and it's right there in front of you so there's no excuse not to learn. Okay so I understand I've been very sort of US heavy. So I've got one more US based artist who was of course iconic within the art world and his passion and love for celebrating the LGBTQ plus community and their rights and that is of course Keith Haring. Now Keith Haring what we're going to talk about is the Heritage of Pride logo which is this beautiful vibrant yellow square and it depicts two figures who have heads that are the male gender symbols that and the, the male gender symbols are linked together. And then it has another two f figures which show the female gender symbol and the female symbols are linked together at their heads. And he created this in the 1980s. Now, Hermitage of Pride is the, is the organisation which hosts New York City's Pride Parade and events in, commemor in commemoration of the Stonewall Riots. And they've done so every year since 19. 69 when the Stonewall riots happened. Haring used his art to discuss many social and political issues affecting the people of New York in the 1970s and 80s, as well as LGBTQ plus rights. He was also, you know, there was uh, the AIDS epidemic, there was also a huge problem with drugs. So his style is arguably a universal language which and makes his works stand out and make him one of the most instantly recognisable artists in the world, even if you don't know him by name. Harrings first received public attention for his graffiti art in subways, where he created white chalk drawings on black, unused advertisement boards and stations, catching the eye of gallery directors and the public. Haring was catapulted into an international recognition and acclaim within a few short years of his career starting. More importantly though, Haring was openly gay and used his platform and art to advocate for safe sex and raise awareness of the crippling HIV crisis in the 1980s. And these are some of his most iconic works. Haring died in February 1990 of AIDS-related complications, but before his death established the Keith Haring Foundation, which provides funding and imagery to AIDS organisations and children's programmes. The foundation states its goal is to keep Haring's wishes and expanding his legacy by providing grants and funding to non-profit organisations that educate disadvantaged youths and inform the public about HIV and AIDS. It also shares his work and contains information about his life, the foundation also supports arts and education institutions by funding exhibitions, educational programmes and publications as well. If you've never been on to the Keith Haring Foundation, it's amazing just the ripple effect this one artist has had on society. And he did so many posters, campaigns, t-shirts, badges that were all sold with the aim of one, raising awareness and celebrating LGBTQ plus rights, as well as most importantly, the AIDS epidemic, which was completely crippling the society and very much sort of shunting people to the side. But also he made works which were affordable, which people would buy and all the money that he raised from these works selling would then go into these foundations to help them produce 
parades and exhibitions and get you know information leaflets to get them out to schools and things like that as well. So he really is somebody who is hugely important. And again, I'll point you back to the first episode of the podcast, which is Keith Haring, Silence Equals Death with Nico Paws. If you want to learn a little bit more about Haring and his championing of LGBTQ plus rights and the his educational push for informing people of safe sex uh, during the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s in America, which if you know nothing about is completely harrowing. And I'll just say for those British listeners, perhaps in America as well, if you have access to E4, if you haven't watched It's a Sin, which came out late 2020, maybe early 2021 by Russell T. Davis, and it's about how when the epidemic came to London, well, came to the UK, but it's, the series is based in London, and it is beyond heartbreaking and just so sad, so, so sad, but it's a really powerful and important watch. So I would say if you haven't watched it, It's a Sin, then I would highly recommend that, that you do. It's It will break your heart forever, but it, it's so important and it's it's fabulously written so informative and just insightful really and I really we need more television series like that even though it's a drama we, we need more important things like that being written and produced and, and out in the world okay and finally I'm going to take it I'm going to sort of fast forward a little bit into 2016 and we're going to come back to London so a nice sort of link in from It's a Sin where it's based I'm going to talk to you about the street artist Stick. Now, for those of you who don't know, Stick is a street artist who came to prominence in the early 2000s in London. Famously, Stick was actually homeless for quite a lot of his life and is a self-taught artist. Essentially, he was in squats and all different things like that and he got hold of a paint can and started having a play around and he realised, oh, he's got a bit of a, a knack to it. And he, he is somebody, a bit like Haring, who when you see his work, when you see his stick figures, and that's what he makes, is stick figures, but they're fantastic. And he's been commissioned to paint things all over the world, and he is still based in London today. So he's a really interesting character, and he's moved slightly into sculpture. He, he unveiled something in Hackney in 2020, which is very similar to the pride banner that I'm going to speak to you about in a minute but he's all about building communities and bringing people together particularly in big cities and I think have, being someone that's lived in a big city for seven years community is is a word that is daren't spoken because it really doesn't exist in certain places but anyway so stick he's a really interesting character if you've not heard of him give him a google but I'm going to talk to you today about his hackney pride banner which is two stick figures against a rainbow backdrop so in 2016, Hackney Council in London commissioned renowned artist and local Hackney resident Stick to create a banner for the council's pride float in the annual Pride Parade in London. And those of you who are London-based that are listening, if you have never been to the Pride Parade, it is a phenomenal way to spend your afternoon. It's just full of people, full of love and appreciation for each other, and it's just a great celebration. So he was commissioned by Hackney Council to create this banner for their Pride float. And this is a handcrafted banner which was produced in collaboration with Flag Makers Limited, which is one of the oldest flag makers in Britain. Which, kind of going back to Gilbert Baker a bit, I never really thought of there being such a thing as a flag makers before. I don't know why, but it is an art form. And I know you can commission private flags if you have like a family crest and things like that, but I just didn't ever think of a flag being an artwork until... I really sort of thought about the importance and the symbolism within flags and belonging and sense of community. Anyway, so Flag Makers Limited, which is one of the oldest flag makers in Britain. So it's a two metre tall banner or flag, if you will, was mounted onto the, ta onto the top of a black hackney carriage taxi cab. Now, if you're thinking, what is a hackney carriage taxi cab? Essentially, when you think of London, you think of red telephone boxes, perhaps Buckingham Palace and taxi cabs. So essentially the black cabs that you see that are very sort of iconic to London and Britain that's actually called a hackney carriage taxi cab. That's the official name for it. So it was mounted to the back of a, a hackney cab 
and was sort of paraded through the city and it later went on display in Hackney, Hackney Museum as well. So something else that Stick does beautifully is he reproduces his prints in local papers and things like that as a way of allowing everyone to get a free work of art. And he does this, you know, every couple of years for Hackney residents and they'll get them free in the local paper and they'll, you'll end up, you'll find them on eBay like an hour later for hundreds of pounds. So, and, and I've actually spoken with Stick personally and he said he doesn't really mind when things like that happen because for him, it's a way of, if someone makes £500 out of him and it's a way of feeding their family, that doesn't bother him. That's the whole point of his his art is to create a community and a sense of belonging and importance. But if someone flogs one of his free works that you can get in a paper and they make a couple hundred pounds, then fair play, good on them. Anyway, so he had reproduced the, the banner in a series of pull-out posters so that People going to Pride from the Hackney area could also go along with their own banner and if they so wished. So I think that's great. It's getting it's, it's encouraging people to get creative and again building a sense of community in terms of if you see someone holding that banner and you have it as well, you know you're both from Hackney and you instantly have a connection with someone. So for me, I think that's a really great way of art bringing people together and symbols and motifs bringing people together. So Stick's Hackney Pride banner was later sold at Christie's auction and raised over £15,000 with all the money from the sale donated to support young LGBTQ plus people through Hackney's Project Indigo. Now, Project Indigo, if you've never heard of this, it's based in Hackney and it provides support groups for Hackney residents. So this LGBTQ plus group and counselling service offers people who are questioning their sexual or gender identity to gather together and discuss their experiences in a supportive and open environment whilst meeting other like-minded youths. These young people were also given the chance to create an exhibition centred on Hackney's rich and diverse LGBTQ plus heritage and the exhibition opened during Pride Month in 2018. So findings from the research of this exhibition were then also distributed to local schools in Hackney so children from a young age can engage with the materials. The materials are also, for anyone interested, are also free online, allowing thousands of people to understand Hackney's LGBTQ plus legacy and empowering people both locally and globally. And for me, this one banner has created this humongous ripple effect a sense of community it's brought people together it's provided counseling services and experience to create proper educational materials which can continuously be accessed for free so for me this symbolizes the community the generosity that i've experienced personally with the lgbtq plus community their creativity their input their warmth and it's this, to me, is, is a great artwork to end the episode on because it's just, if that doesn't make you feel good about how art can impact people and spread a positive message and help people in, in communities, I don't know what else will. So Stick's Pride Banner from 2016, for me, is an all-time special art history moment. And there you have it, another episode of Joe's Art History Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed my whistle-stop tour through the art of pride and please do check out the links in the show notes below if you're interested in learning anything further about any of the pieces which I spoke about today. If you'd like to get in touch, please do feel free to do so. You can email me, joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can DM me on Instagram, which is at joesarthistory. My DMs are always open. As always, any images which we discuss today will be available to view on my highlights reel on my Instagram page, at Joe's Art History. And if you find the number that this podcast is and go along my highlights reel, you'll find the images under the corresponding number. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you were able to leave a review. So if you're listening on iTunes, you can leave me a review there. And if you know, if you're listening on Spotify, you can also leave me a review. So there's a little um, button right at the top left hand side. If you go onto the homepage of the podcast and there should be something that says mark this podcast. So it'd be lovely if you could give me a rating 
It's completely up to you, but five stars, of course, would mean the world. Finally, I've been Jo McLaughlin, your host and your resident art historian here on Jo's Art History Podcast, and I really look forward to welcoming you next time on the show. Until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all. Bye.